This episode is sponsored by Simple Practice. Running a private practice is rewarding, but it also can be demanding. Simple Practice changes that. This practice management solution helps you focus on what's most important, your clients, by simplifying the business side of private practice like billing and scheduling. Stick around for a special offer at the end of this episode. You're listening to the Modern Therapist Survival Guide, where therapists live, breathe, and practice as human beings. To support you as a whole person and a therapist, here are your hosts, Kurt Widhelm and Katie Vernoy. Welcome back, Modern Therapists. This is the Modern Therapist Survival Guide. I'm Kurt Widhelm with Katie Vernoy, and in our ever ongoing attempts to cover all of the special populations that come up in the world, it's been drawn to our attention that a lot of the discussions around LGBTQ plus clients tend to not focus on the B part so much. And in being able to address our clients and our clinicians who come from the bisexual worlds, we have been joined today by Dr. Mimi Huang, She is a bisexual psychologist, author, activist, and she's going to help us explore this world of bi erasure. And thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me. We're so excited to have you here. I saw you speak and I was just so taken with this topic. And it really was very eye-opening for me to be able to understand the benefits of bi plus affirmative practice and that kind of stuff. And so I am very excited that you're joining us today. And so as we ask all of our guests, who are you and what are you putting out into the world? Great. Thank you so much, Katie. Yes, I've been a psychologist now for a little while. And, you know, before I became a clinician, I was actually a community uh, organizer uh, in the Los Angeles area. And for me, it was really important, you know, after my own coming out experience and really not having any role models, any supports growing up, you know, also being a person of color, an immigrant, a first generation college student, I really never heard the B word ever growing up. So it was really something um, in terms of my growing up experience that I just thought you were either gay or you were straight. And so I really didn't know how to make sense of my own sexuality. And uh, so it wasn't until college that I really even heard the word be bisexual. And of course, this was in the early 90s. So, you know, the internet was sort of really new. There wasn't social media, there wasn't YouTube. And so it wasn't until, you know, fortunately, I went to a very progressive university that had LGBT presence on campus. And so at that time, it really took me a little while to figure out who I was. And thankfully, there was a mentoring program uh, for students who are LGBT and questioning. And so that really helped me. And as a result, I was asked to create the first bisexual student group. And this was at UCLA. And so it was really great for me to be able to help other students like myself who are exploring themselves, who didn't even know what questions to ask to figure out who they were. So through that, you know, that was in 1999. So that was uh, over 20 years ago at this point. I started my bi leadership and started creating other resources. Uh, You know, I presented and, and talked at universities and other college campuses. I really wanted to help spread the word and help you know, other young people and just people in general know that, you know, bisexuality is something that exists um, and that it's okay. It's okay to be bi. And so through that, I've created three different uh, bisexual organizations in Los Angeles. So that group was called Fluid at UCLA. That's another identity term, and we can talk a little bit more about that. But that's an identity term that's very common amongst uh, people who are non-monosexual, so not gay or straight. And then I created a social group in Los Angeles at the time because there wasn't one. And I thought there has to be a space for people like me to meet each other and make friends and and just, you know, find community. So I created AMBI, which at the time stood for a meeting of bi individuals. And also AMBI, you know, sort of the uh, ambiguous prefix, which we really liked. 
And then later in 2008, I helped to co-found the Los Angeles Bi Task Force, uh, which is the nonprofit promoting education, advocacy, uh, and culture enrichment for the bisexual community in greater Los Angeles. So that's uh, really how kind of my bi activism got started through helping to create these organizations and to get people together. I've done other things, publishing and speaking and, and training and all of that. But, you know, along that journey, I also became a clinical psychologist and uh, got licensed and started working with young people where identity exploration is really, you know, a ripe time for them. And so through that, I've also become really passionate about talking about bisexual mental health. So really marrying both of those interests and passions together. And that's how I, you know, have started doing all these different trainings for different psychological and therapist organizations. I know that what I'm about to say to you is probably no surprise to you whatsoever, but the the research base on people who come from a bi background, I imagine is very, very small just because it's so hard to study people who don't fit into these nice mono boxes that, you know, historically, and this is probably a big part of that, you know, ambiguity that you're talking about and that space for, for exploration that needs to happen without kind of this nice knowledge base that other people have done and, and people like you who are blazing this pathway, what kinds of, of challenges are you finding that bi plus people are running into? Yeah, there's so many because I, you know, we live in a very binary world, Kurt, like you mentioned, we're in a lot of boxes, you know, black or white, gay or straight. And so being able to see who you are is just really hard when you don't think that that exists. And so if you grow up and you find that you're attracted to one gender, you know, the other gender, you might assume automatically that you're straight. But if you notice that you're attracted to the same gender, um, you're like, well, does that mean I'm gay now? And so it can really create this sense of being pulled in two different directions. It just creates this dissonance, right? When we talk about you know, being in line with who you are and congruent in your thoughts, feelings, and actions, which, you know, therapists, we talk about that a lot. It can just be so challenging when you think that you need to identify a certain way or to have only certain types of relationships because those are the ones that are socially acceptable, you know, namely other sex relationships, right? So those are in the heteronormative world that we grow in, those are the relationships that are deemed socially acceptable by folks. And this includes bisexual, pansexual, fluid, people who identify as queer as well, um, who just don't fit in those boxes. It can be just really tough with figuring who, what your identity is, and then having healthy relationships, and then being able to come out to people, you know, in your families, friends, jobs, you know, that kind of thing. So how would you recommend that therapists support this community? Because it seems like, and I'm going to reword the question to kind of frame it how we normally do, but to me, it seems like because there's, like Kurt was saying, not a knowledge base and because there's so much confusion or ambiguity or those types of things. I would imagine that therapists get a lot of things wrong in working with bisexual and pansexual, fluid, queer individuals. What would you say that many therapists get wrong when working with this highly diverse group of people? Well, it's hard to pinpoint just one, unfortunately. <laughs> <laughs> um, I wish I could say there was just one thing. Go ahead and list. Like we, okay. we got we Go got plenty of time here. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yes. How much time do I have? Through my work as a psychologist, through a researcher and community activist, I've read studies, I've talked to people. I've also done a local community needs assessment here in Los Angeles. I, you know, we surveyed close to 300 people who identify on the bi plus spectrum. And we looked at, you know, sort of how they identified, whether they're out to their therapists, you know, how did that experience go? And not everyone comes out to their therapist. 
I think the number was around 70%. And that seemed like a low number to me. That number could be higher, right? And so, you know, it just really makes you think about do your clients, are they completely open to you and telling you what their sexual orientation is? I mean, that's such a core part of a person's identity, you know, age, ethnicity, relationship status, sexual orientation. And so those are pieces of information that I think therapists really need to get right. And there's some reason that bi plus clients are not all telling their therapists. And, you know, there were comments from people about, oh, my therapist, you know, just assumed I was gay or my therapist assumed that, you know, everything about my life was about my bisexuality or that, you know, I couldn't be faithful or I, that I really needed meds, even though I didn't. And so there's oftentimes this over pathologizing that can happen when therapists are working with I plus clients. I think there still maybe is this underlying sense that there's something unhealthy about being bi plus when there is absolutely no research, no credible evidence that, you know, in non-clinical populations that there is anything wrong with being bi. It is absolutely normal. It's just is. And, you know, so I think that therapists, you know, still have their own biases. You know, we're human right? We aren't perfect and we're not immune from all the different, you know, forces and prejudices that are out there in the world. And I think it's important that we acknowledge that. We acknowledge what we have been raised with in order to really counter those ideas. So there's just so many things in terms of um, not accepting uh, also that a bisexual client could really just be bisexual you know, that they're on their way to another type of identity. So I think that that can also be something that unfortunately clients will get, you know, they're coming to this safe space that they believe where they can really be themselves and maybe focus on, you know, I don't know, dating or their career or, you know, something like that. And the therapist may really zone in and say, well, you know, why don't you come out all the way? Right. So there is, can, you know, sometimes be that sense where even the therapist will box in that client. So, you know, I think that there's so many different, different assumptions. And also, I think sometimes there's this belief that there's really only one way to be bisexual, too. So both this sense of like, it doesn't exist, you know, you have to be gay or you have to be straight, but also if you're bi, then it has to look a certain way, which is the 50, 50, uh, sort of mm. type that you have to be equally attracted to men and to women, um, or that there's, you know, even just those two genders, but maybe you have to be able to have shown that you've dated like, you know, 50% men and 50% women. There's really this kind of quantification of it, which just really doesn't make sense, um, you know, for a lot of five plus people. And I think that this has to go to kind of the larger society's myths around bisexuality and therapists falling into those traps too. And, you know, hopefully, you know, I, I just have this funny image in my head of being, you know, somebody who wants to see the the bisexual people with just kind of like an abacus out there that's saying like, okay, I've dated this many people of one sex just to prove <laughs> what, what they yeah. have. And, <laughs> but I have also heard in the past that, you know, this is where some of the people from the traditional homosexual side too have kind of contributed to some of the bisexual erasure because of what's deemed as just kind of this option to pass or this option to be fluid in whatever the situation calls for in order to not face the same difficulties of coming out. Yeah, it's, you know, that's the unfortunate thing that a lot of bi plus folks experience is biphobia from the gay community. Unfortunately, we're not one big happy family, as <laughs> one might assume and would hope. But yeah, unfortunately, there are 
there are a lot of people who also assume that, you know, we're, we're one foot in, one foot out, and that we're somehow not gay enough. And that can also pose just so much pressure on that bi plus individual to act or talk or, you know, in a, in a certain way um, when they're in a, you know, gay sort of context. And so, you know, some people will change the pronouns of their partners in order to sort of, you know, hide that too, because they don't want to face, you know, scrutiny, um, hostility, you know, skepticism from the gay community. And so that, that gets really unfortunate too. And, you know, I, I think that there's just a lot of wounds. There's a lot of wounds that the gay community has faced. And sometimes that sort of gets, you know, projected onto us by plus folks, because we sort of are seen as not fully in the community, even though so many of us, you know, are in the community. I mean, we are, we're members of the community. We are queer. And so there just, you know, is that, that animosity and that tension that happens. And unfortunately, you know, I've, you know, heard a lot of things about, you know, sometimes support groups, for example, if it's a, you know, queer women support group at like an LGBT center or something like that, that if there's a bi plus uh, woman in the group, that if she brings up anything about, oh, my boyfriend or my ex-boyfriend, that all of a sudden, you know, she'll get all of this, you know, scrutiny. And so there's that, you know, sense like, oh, no, you're not one of us or, you know, what are you doing here? And so that, you know, poses this stress, right? Like, do I, do I belong? You know, am I, you know, able to partake in these resources and these, you know, supports? Um, And so unfortunately that can happen. Now, not all gay and lesbian folks, you know, have that, that same attitude. I want to put that out there as well. I think there's, you know, so many wonderful, wonderful gay and lesbian men and women who really accept people for who they are. And, you know, my wife, for example, she identifies as a lesbian and she's, you know, my biggest fan um, <laughs> in terms of my professional bisexual career. And she comes to, you know, so many of the bi events that I, you know, go to and, and I'm involved in. Um, and so it's definitely, you know, um, a lot of people who are very supportive and just are accepting that that's just who you are. But um, unfortunately, that can happen when it becomes, you know, about this sort of identity politics. I think for some of our audience, they may not have a sense of what bi erasure is. And I think that's a really important concept to define. Maybe you can give us a little bit more context for that. Yeah, I think we've been hinting at it, you know, that we assume that everything is binary. And so when you hear about someone's bisexuality, you might automatically sort of dismiss that. And later on, that person might get mislabeled as gay or as straight, um, even though they've maybe publicly, you know, come out as bi or queer or pansexual. And so that's one form of bi erasure. You know, there are people in, in history, celebrities, you know, famous people who were pretty publicly bisexual or talked about their bisexuality. David Bowie, for example, he was very out about it. He was interviewed about it, but then, you know, people kept asking him, like he kept being questioned and, you know, assumed he was one way or the other. Uh, Alexander the Great, you know, people knew about his male and female lovers, but, you know, when you read about certain history books or, you know, certain portrayals of his life, there's only certain relationships that are mentioned, right? So, you know, there are ways in which historical figures are mislabeled. And that's one way that bi erasure can happen. Also, it can just be like sort of an automatic assumption when you see uh, a person and maybe they have a date, right? So they have a partner, you see them holding hands. So, you know, a woman and she's holding hands with a, a male partner. And there's this assumption that, oh, okay, she's straight or both of them are straight, right? But actually, we don't know that. We don't know what their sexual orientation is because that's just sort of who they're 
currently bringing to this party, but yeah. they might be bisexual, one or both of them. Right. And so it's something that is not necessarily that you're always going to be tangibly seen. Yeah. And so that erasure can also happen. Also, another way that that might happen is in you know, talking about the community and using terms like gay and transgender. Mm -hmm. So that's a more kind of intentional exclusion where you are leaving out, you're omitting. So you're saying gay people, you're saying transgender people, but it's really the LGBT. And these days I use LGBTQ plus or LGBT plus. I think that's a great way to be very inclusive. You know, the B has been added to the you know, acronym for decades now. So I think, you know, when I hear myself, when I hear gay and lesbian and just that, or I hear gay and transgender, I really feel excluded and left out. And so that is a, a very, very similar experience for a lot of bi plus folks out there. So I think it's important when we're using language, uh, vocabulary, terms, uh, and we're talking about the community to really make sure we're intentionally including those letters. So besides kind of wanting to, to put everything in neat little box, binary boxes, what are some of the other reasons that you think that people are excluding bi plus people? Well, uh, you know, maybe there's still these underlying sort of assumptions that bisexuality doesn't exist. You know, that's just going to be something that we're going to have to continually challenge. Uh, I think there was a study that came out just recently asking folks, you know, if they believe that bisexuality you know, exists or if sexual orientation is binary. And about 40% of people agreed that it was binary. So there's only gay and only straight. 40% believe that you know, there's a spectrum. Uh, and then 20% weren't sure. And this was released just a few you know, years ago. And wow. so there still is a lot of prejudice out there. Sometimes these belief systems are really, really hard to shake. One of the areas that I like to address with a lot of our guests is how this seems to get missed in therapist education. And so little of, of just sex and sexuality that's taught in many therapist training programs in general let alone, you know, mm -hmm. that this is, seems to be one of those areas where there just seems to be like a couple of sentences in therapist textbooks like, yeah, I, I guess bi people exist too. And they're somewhere <laughs> in between gay and straight. <laughs> like, mm -hmm. that yeah, also much. so much contributes to this. How can we get this into people's trainings earlier, even amidst all of this confusion and making this a, a much bigger conversation. So just even having me on the show and uh, shedding light, giving me a, a stage uh, to talk about these things is really important and really dispelling these myths. So I think sometimes with you know, this assumption that bisexuality doesn't exist, there's this notion that there's just so few of us that are out there, right? Like we are just this tiny, tiny sliver of the population because, you know, most of us are either gay or we're straight or you have to fit into this, to this like 50, 50 definition. Otherwise you're not. When in fact, there's just so many studies showing that actually the B makes up the biggest group within LGB and T as well. We are actually a majority of the LGBT population. And so if we're going to even study sexual orientation, we have to make sure we're spending a good amount of time on the B to really understand, you know, sexual orientation as a whole. If you are a therapist, you know, looking at the clients who come in through your door, break it down. How many people who are straight, gay, bi, trans, you know, we're seeing it in our counseling center at Loyola Marymount University that there are more bisexual clients coming in than gay and lesbian students. And so it is absolutely reflecting in our numbers. And I think people are maybe just not 
conscious of that, uh, that we are comprised of a larger population than, you know, maybe once understood. And so that's, I think, going to be really an important uh, idea to start really disseminating out there. I think really making sure that any kind of information you have, if you have a presentation, if you're, you know, writing up a report or a study, that you're going to include the B. Being aware of whenever you're representing anything around gender, sexuality, that the B is always a part of that. And if you're having speakers, you know, or trainers, you know, wherever you're working, in terms of the people that you bring in, trying to have a diverse sample, right? So look at that too. You know, those are different ways in which you can be more inclusive of the people that you are are bringing in, because that's going to definitely make an effect on, you know, people's training, being able to have that sort of conceptualization of, okay, well, these are the clients that I'm going to be having, you know, are going to be walking through my door. There are online trainings. You know, I'm not the only person doing these trainings, although I, I do. There are other speakers or other programs that offer LGBT inclusive trainings. If you are a therapist who wants to really make sure you're, you have your multicultural competence That's something that is developing, right? Because we're never fully competent. You know, even myself being a bi woman of color, I am always learning more. I'm always reading. I'm always trying to get more trainings. And so make sure that you are looking for these topics or ask for them. You know, if you're not seeing it somewhere within your organization, your association, wherever, ask for it say, hey, would you mind, you know, having a speaker talk about this or that? So in looking at this, because I think this is the part of uh, the, the podcast that we like to be very practical. How can therapists be bioaffirmative in their practices? What are the things that, and I understand that this is probably at least an eight hour training, if not more. So this is obviously a very short answer to a very uh, long question. But I, I'm just thinking the specific things that I'm thinking about are around identity exploration. I'm thinking about, you know, kind of the work, but also just about making sure that you're opening space so that your client will actually come out to you. I mean, I, that just blows me away that clients aren't coming out to therapists, or at least 30% of them are not. And so what do you think are the most important steps that therapists now, besides going and getting more training? I think that one we definitely need to do. But in addition to that, what are a few things that therapists can incorporate to be more bioaffirmative in their therapy practices? I think first you need to ask the sexual orientation question. You know, I do it. I do it as a very routine practice. And I would hope that all therapists are doing that. But in your paperwork, with your clients before they come in through the door or on the first session, make sure you're asking what is your sexual orientation and make sure that there's enough options, you know? So if it's a checkbox or whatever that is, you know, in your system that you have, make sure that bisexual is on there. You know, you're only going to have one have, you know, gay, straight, bisexual questioning or prefer not to say right? Now, if it's a fill in the blank, I think that can also help as there are people who, you know, even within the bi plus group don't like the term bisexual, maybe pansexual, queer or fluid works better for them. But really making sure that that already, that's that's setting the stage that you see and acknowledge that that is an option even, you Mm -hmm. know, in terms of your identity. And then in the session, I usually ask verbally, So that is something that I do as a routine practice. And even though it might feel redundant, but I really think that it sets the the tone as well for your client that you are comfortable talking about sexual orientation. It's saying, hey, this is okay. This is okay for us to talk about. If you're working with young people, teens, adolescents, you might want to say, do you like boys, girls, both? Are you unsure? You know, so you might ask it in that way because they might be just sort of young in their identity development to really know terms. Although these days, you know, our young people are really, really savvy. So, you know, you might get 
a 12 year old or 13 year old who's like, I know I'm queer. So even though, you know, you're working with people that are younger, really asking that, you know, question, I think sets the, set the tone. And then also what I do is I ask about partners and make sure that your, you know, biases are not up when someone says they're married, right? So just because they're married doesn't mean they're straight. You know, you can be bi and married, you can be gay and married. And so use gender neutral terms when you're, you know, first asking, do you have a significant other? Do you have a spouse? Right. So those are other ways that you can be by affirming because you're allowing for a whole range of answers. When I ask about relationship history, I will also try to clarify gender of partners. You know, because, again, we have our biases up. And just because right now your client has, let's say, a female partner doesn't mean that all their partners in the past were female. Okay, so I might just, you know, quickly ask, oh, uh, what was the gender of your partner? You know, something like that. And that also cues your client to understanding that, oh, my therapist isn't going to assume, Mm -hmm. you know, so if I had, let's say, you know, five partners, but one of them had a different gender, hey, maybe my therapist wouldn't freak out if that was the case. Or what if my next partner is of a different gender. My, you know, my therapist isn't going to freak out. It's not going to be a huge thing. So just those really subtle questions, I think really communicates to your client that you're by affirming. Now, if your client does come out to you as, you know, some identity on the bypass spectrum, use that term, you know, use the same term that they're using. So that also is very affirming, you know, because you're not then questioning it. You're not, you know, putting your spin on it. You're not erasing them. You know, you're, you're really just accepting it. So those are, you know, some of those like basics that I think are really important, you know, just to put out there. So treat them like people, create space <laughs> to give them the opportunity to identify themselves, adopt their language trust that they are going through a a process that and give them the space to be able to talk about that seems pretty simple right (laughs) yeah and at the risk of oversimplifying it uh, a little bit but well and i think we laugh but but i've had clients come to me that say that they had therapists that questioned them that they were actually bi or that they you know or used different language or did some of this erasure stuff and i was so glad i had seen mimi spoke speak before that because i was like bisexuality does exist. And they're like, Yay. Oh, like they were so <laughs> they were yes. like, thank goodness. Thank goodness. You yes. know? And so I think it's, it's something where people aren't getting this. And I think that it, for some, whatever reason, it's okay. And I'm putting that in air quotes that you can't see that bisexuality has been erased or that there's biphobia. Like it, it's, it's not okay. So I'm sorry, Kurt, you were going to say something else, but I just was, I was thinking about this. I was like, oh my gosh, I can't believe it seems so simple and people aren't doing it. Thank you so much for joining us today, Dr. Mimi. Where can people find out more about you and all of the wonderful projects that you're working on? Yeah, thanks. So you can go to my website. It's drmimihuang.com and you can see uh, links to my social media. You can see my calendar and events. We'll include links to all of Dr. Mimi's stuff in our show notes. You can find those at mtsgpodcast.com. And while you're over there, check out our Therapy Reimagined conference and all of the updates that are happening to that. It's a world where things are constantly changing for our events too. So check out the website for the most up-to-date information on what's going on with that. So until next time, I'm Kurt Woodhelm with Katie Renoy and Dr. Mimi Huang. Thanks again to our sponsor, Simple Practice, the leading EHR platform for private practitioners everywhere. Join Katie, me, and more than 60,000 other professionals who use Simple Practice to power telehealth sessions, schedule appointments, file insurance claims, communicate with clients, and so much more, all on one HIPAA-compliant platform. Get your first two months of Simple Practice for the price of one when you sign up for an account today. 
This exclusive offer is valid for new customers only. Make sure you check this out, folks, because I really love Simple Practice. It's made my practice way easier. And if you can get a couple of months to check it out, I think it will be very, very helpful. Go to simplepractice.com forward slash therapy reimagined to learn more. Thank you for listening to the Modern Therapist Survival Guide. Learn more about who we are and what we do at mtsgpodcast.com. You can also join us on Facebook and Twitter. And please don't forget to subscribe so you don't miss any of our episodes. 